Shields up, Iron Breakers. Welcome back to Grand Blue Fantasy Relink. Today I'm going to be bringing you my guide for this game. I realize it took me a little bit longer than usual to put this one out there. I'm sorry about that, but I've been having one hell of a busy week. Now before somebody jumps into the comment section to let me know that the video is too long and there's no way in hell they're ever going to watch a video as long as this, let me make one thing perfectly clear. This video is going to last as long as it needs to, and that is the reason why I put chapters on the video. If you do not have the inclination to watch the whole thing, you don't have to. You can just jump to the section that is relevant to you, consume whatever information you need to, and move on with your life. Or, if you are so inclined, you can also watch the whole thing. And by the way, if you actually learn anything new in this video, I would really appreciate it if you would hit the like button because it really helps me out. So, thank you for that, and let's get things started. So, very early on in the game, you're going to be going through a very brief tutorial. You're just going to be playing this character, who is Gran, the captain. And shortly after that tutorial, you're going to be dropped in this village. This is going to be your main hub for a while, so let's get a little bit familiar with it. There are three main services that you need to be aware of. Service number one. The quest counter. This is pretty self-explanatory if you've ever played a Monster Hunter game. If you have never played a Monster Hunter game, this is where you come to get your quests. Not just quests, sometimes story progression will also be required to be done here. Other times, story progression will take place uh, at the end of this road here, which takes you towards your airship. Basically, you're going to have a yellow indicator that is going to tell you exactly where you need to go whenever you are in the main story. Shouldn't really be that complicated. Now, besides the quest counter, the other service that you have here is the blacksmith. Now, the blacksmith is where you're going to be coming to upgrade all of your weapons. We're going to be diving a little bit more into detail about this particular gentleman a little bit further ahead in the video. And then finally, you have Sierra Carte. Now, Sierra Carte can, or the Knickknack Shack, the Sierra Carte is the character that uh, manages the Knickknack Shack. This is a place where you can come to trade treasures, materials that you might need, important sigils, as well as a wealth of other things. I could do a whole other video just dedicated to this character, so I'm not going to be going too in-depth about all the things that you can do in here, but we will be coming back here throughout the video in order to get you guys at least familiar with some of the more important aspects that you can get from Sierra Carte. Now, these are the three main services that you're going to have available to you in the village, but there is one other that is not really signaled, and it really should be because it is a very important service, which is training. You also have a training location that you can go to. So eventually you'll reach a point uh, in the game progression where you can just come in here and they will tell you, do you want to go to the Grand Cipher? This should be very early in the game. So whenever you can just come to this pier and go to the Grand Cipher, you'll want to go ahead and do that because this is going to enable you to go into a location where you can actually use that training dummy over there so that you can practice your class and test out different um, characters that you unlock as you play through the game so that you can learn that character's gimmick, which is one of the most important things for you to learn when you are playing Grand Blue Fantasy. And you guys are like, character gimmick, what do you mean? In this game, every character has a gimmick that is kind of like how you're supposed to play them. So in this video, I'm going to be showing you the, the gimmick of the main character, which is Grand. If you want to know more about specific characters, feel free to leave those in the comments and I'll try to prioritize the ones who are the most upvoted or stuff like that. But basically, once you get here, you can just press start. This allows you to go into your character screen where you can go and do a whole bunch of stuff. But one of the most important things you want to check out straight from the get go is if you look to the bottom right hand side, you'll notice that there's a, a legend there that tells you all of the actions that each different button does. And one of those says character details. So you're going to want to press that and that is going to give you the information about, you know, your character stats and all of that stuff, the skills that you currently have equipped, as well as your a little bit of your gimmick on the bottom section there. So adept arts. Skills are enhanced based on adept arts levels. Landing combo finishers raises arts level and the level resets shortly after a skill is activated. So what is this telling you? This is telling you that when it comes to Gran, his whole thing is he powers up his arts by landing combo finishers. Then you also have Adrenaline Rush, greatly increases power, raises charge speed when charged immediately after a combo finisher. This is a little bit weird, 
But what that means is at the end of your combo, you can do charged attacks faster. So the gimmick of Gran is doing his whole combo and then finishing the combo and going into a charged attack. I'm going to be showing you how to do that. But another thing that you can also uh, look up is you can press square once you're in the screen and it will tell you a couple of examples of combos that you can go and do. So combo A could be square, triangle, triangle, square, square, triangle, triangle so on and so forth and then power raise is the charge attack that i was talking about so let, let's just go ahead into training mode you can go over here the barrel and this is also very good for you to practice like any character that you want to so that you can kind of understand the combat flow that you're supposed to have so when it comes to grand like i told you you're supposed to go ahead and do your combo now your combo is one two three four this is Grand's combo. Then you have a combo finisher after that, which is triangle. So one, two, three, four, and combo finisher. Now we're gonna let that link attack go. We'll talk a little bit more about link attacks in just a second here. But after you do that combo finisher, which is triangle, and I'm saying triangle, if you're on PC, make sure to adapt because there, there should be like main attack, secondary attack or something like that. So square is your main attack, triangle is your secondary attack. But basically, once you do that last triangle hit, if you keep triangle pressed, he is going to charge. So one, two, three, four, five. Keeping it pressed. And as you can see, fully charged. Unleash. This is his gimmick. Now, if you notice, we charge that attack at the end really fast. If you were to do that charge manually by just holding down triangle, notice how it takes a lot longer. So, you know, that is Grand's gimmick, and that is one of the things that you want to understand how each character's gimmick works, right? Anyway, now that you have Arts level 4, if you do your Arts, they're going to deal more damage. And then the Arts level go back down, and once the Arts levels go back down, you know, you're going to want to go ahead and level them back up if you want to do efficient Arts. But again, that is the gimmick of this character. Each character has its own gimmick. You'll want to pay attention to that. Now, you just saw something there, which is a link attack. That is going to happen every now and then. When that happens, just press circle or whatever button happens to be for link attack. If you're playing on PC, you will want to do that because that is going to level up your link meter over there on the middle right hand side. We are now at 4%. So the more of these attacks you do, eventually you get to link time, which is a mode that just gives you tons of bonus damage and stuff like that, just so that you can kind of understand. This is something that you want to practice, get into the habit of actually using your link time whenever it pops up, because you can always just pop your link time, your character instantly goes into an attack. And the real cool thing about Grand too is that when you do link attack, you can actually also get the benefit of the faster charge speed. So, if we go here and we trigger another one, which by the way, if you're wondering how do you trigger link attacks, notice that there's a gauge that rises up on the monster every time I hit him, right? And as you can see that right there, it's about to come up. When that comes up, the link attack gets triggered and that's boom, how you go and you do a link attack. However, there's a cooldown period. As you can see, there's now a purple gauge that's diminishing. That means that you can't trigger link attacks for a little bit because otherwise you could really just abuse monsters by triggering link attacks all the friggin time okay so let's go ahead and do that again see see how it charges up and then boom link attack and then we can do quick charge after link attacks with grand as well usually other characters will also get benefit from link attacks so you'll just have to figure out what the benefit is to each character but that's why it's so important for you to come in here and train and understand how link attack works how your character can benefit from Link Attack, how your character can benefit from, from the arts that it's doing, and all of that stuff. And at any point during the, during the training session, you can also bring up the start menu, and they have a character tutorial, which is a very brief tutorial that gives you an idea of what that gimmick is. It gives you a brief description of the character as well, but as you can see here, Captain creates various combos using square and triangle. His triangle attack is chargeable for more power. Pulling off combos raises the Captain's adept's arts level. Skills becomes more powerful at adept art level, so master those combos. So, you know, they give you a very brief thing, and then you also have the training menu, that, uh, wait, not the training menu. 
Uh, you also have the command list that tells you the combos and all of that stuff. And you can also go to the training menu and swap out some gear, should you choose to do so, to test out sigils and other stuff. I'll give you guys more details about those. But for now, just be aware that learning your character's gimmick is one of the most important things that you can possibly do in this game. Because you're not playing your character right until you understand the character gimmick. Okay? So, let's go back to Folka so that we can talk about another important thing, which is unlocking new characters. Because that's going to be one of the things that you're going to want to know. You're going to be like, okay, I don't really like Gran. I want to unlock new characters. How do I do this? Very well. As you play through the campaign, they're going to eventually give you something, which is called a crewmate card. Once you get a crewmate card by just playing through the campaign, you can come over here, crewmate card, allies available, and you can choose which crewmate you want to get. Now, an important thing is whenever you have crewmate cards, you want to make sure that you wish list them before you use them. So if we actually go back and we go into our inventory, if we press the start menu, we can go into the inventory and in the inventory, if you actually look, you will be able to find where the crewmate card is. Fortunately, there's a ton of materials to go through, but the crewmate card will be there. And once you find that crewmate card, just see if we can actually get there because Jesus Christ and on top of it I'm usually blind to this stuff here we go it's close to the very bottom once you get there you can actually press square and you can add a crewmate card to the wish list okay you guys are like why is this so important because this is going to allow you to find other quests that also have a crewmate card so the moment you get your first crewmate card go to the inventory go to the very bottom of your inventory it should be there and Check the crewmate card, hit square on it, or whatever button it says for wish list. If you guys notice, bottom right-hand side, you'll see there's a legend with what every button does. If you're playing on PC, most likely there'll be a key associated with it. Press that and add it somewhere to the wish list. That just means select the square where you want to place it and place it down. Now, in my case, I already have it here, so it's not going to let me put it down again, but just choose one of these squares and place the crewmate card on there. Now, why is that important? Like I said, after you get the crewmate card and you add it to your wish list, you can then come to the quest counter and there is a function here. If you go undertake quest, there is a function where you, which you can do, again, bottom right hand side. Something there says search by treasure. You press the respective button, which on PlayStation is square, and that'll let you go ahead and select a reward that you want to get. So in this case, be the crewmate card and it will tell you which quests have it. Now, in my case, I don't have any quests that currently give a crewmate card because I've done all of them. That's why I still have three leftover cards and I already unlocked a whole bunch of characters. So keep that in mind. You will be able to unlock every single character in the game. So mostly what you are doing right now is choosing which characters you unlock first. Like I said, there will be quests that reward you this crewmate card, and they will also be given to you by simply advancing through the campaign. So there's no easy way at the beginning of the game, oh, I just want to unlock five characters. Can't do that. Advance the campaign, unlock more quests, and eventually you will be able to do it. Just keep checking in with the quests, make sure you add this to your wish list, and you'll be able to check when new crewmate cards are available so that you can go and unlock additional characters. Now, the quest counter also gives you missions. And missions, at the beginning, they're not super important because at the beginning, you're only, you're only gonna have these novice Skyfarer quests. The veteran Skyfarer quests only unlock after you finish the main story. So finishing the main story should actually be one of your priorities because otherwise you're gonna be very limited as to which quests you can go and do. They, these quests will also give you specific rewards in case you're grinding something to upgrade a weapon or something like that. We're going to be talking about weapon upgrades as well in just a couple of seconds here. But just be aware these quests are available. They are optional. You don't have to do them to complete the main story quest. The main story quest pretty much gives you almost everything that you need in order to complete that quest, even in the hardest difficulty. So you don't need to do a lot of grinding to complete the main quest. These are completely optional. These can also be done in multiplayer. But an important thing is, if you're trying to do something uh, a little bit more advanced later into the game, you can actually sort these quests by type 
because it's also going to inform you as to what you can do with them. So in the case of bosses, these are going to give you specific treasures. So some weapons are associated with uh, a boss. And in order for you to upgrade or limit break that weapon, you're going to need specific materials from that boss. So that's what these quests are for. Horde, for those who need more weapon leveling materials. So if you need materials to level up your weapon because you, you need these fortitude shards, these are the type of quests that you want to do. Same thing for conquest quests. If you go to these quests, you're going to be getting more of those materials to level up your weapons. Survival, if you need experience and mastery points. This is going to be something that we're going to be touching up on a little bit later, but your characters level up, so EXP, pretty self-explanatory, you get more levels. Mastery points, I'll talk about those in just a second. Defense, for those who need more weapon uncapping materials, there's a specific material that you need alongside a whole bunch of boss materials, uh, which is a quality raffinium. It's a, it's a material called raffinium. And these quests give that material, which is a generic material. And then Explore, again, is experience and mastery points. And Explore is a very different quest. There's only one Explore quest that I've unlocked so far. And it's basically collect a couple of coins while you're sliding through the desert. So it's not really a super engaging quest. But, you know, it's just something to maybe break the monotony. So just be aware you can come and do these missions. And each mission is going to serve a specific purpose uh, when you start needing some materials. But more on that in just a couple of seconds. Now, besides missions, there's also another thing in here called a fate episode. So these are going to be character backstories and you will want to do these. And I understand that for a lot of players, you're gonna look at this and you're like, oh, I don't wanna do those. And the reasoning is these are basically static text on a static background. They give you the voice over the text, so I'm just going to show you guys the prologue for the main character. It's something that looks like this. They give you the static background, and now there's voice acting in the back while, you Our know. Adventure began with a strange light falling over my home island. And you might be like, well, I don't want to go through that. Well, that's fine. You can just skip it. And after you skip it, it still gets completed. So even if you skip through everything, make sure that you do it. However, you do have a couple of them in here that are actually missions. So episode four, that is a mission. And episode eight, that is another mission. I personally like some of the stories. Not all of them are fantastic. Like, I don't think the grand story is fantastic. This is, I've only done two Fate episodes so far. Oigen's story, though, I actually really liked it. I liked Oigen's story. I understand it's not going to be for everyone. But the point is, if you want to min-max your character, you definitely want to do this because whenever you complete uh, episode four, you get a sigil, um, an additional sigil unlock, which is very important. And when you complete episode eight, you get another sigil unlock, which again is extremely important. So you definitely want to do these quests. Not to mention every single one of these uh, prologue quests and episodes and whatnot gives you additional stats to your character. So I cannot emphasize this enough, complete fate episodes because they make your character more powerful, okay? If you do not complete your character's fate episode, you are essentially gimping yourself, okay? So just keep that in mind. If you want to skip through them, feel free to skip through them. I don't think that story is the strong point of this game. I think the story is okay. But still, just go through it to get your stats if that's what you need to, and you get your sigil unlocks, which is extremely, extremely important. Right, now, hidden throughout the, these villages, there will also be chests. Now, I've already opened all of the chests in both villages that, that we have access to in the game. Uh, like this particular chest, for instance, was locked with a silver key. So you will not be able to open the chest from the get-go. However, if you just collect all of the side quests that the game has, which if you can actually look at the top of the screen, you can see that there's these little pamphlets with the monster's face on them. These will take you to a side quest. So if I talk with this guy, he's going to give me a side quest. You can accept it. And then once you complete it, it is going to give you rewards. Now, the one that is in here is actually a repeatable quest so that you can keep getting some stuff that you constantly need, like a little bit of experience, mastery points. Even though this quest is actually bugged right now, if you're playing the game on certain difficulties, but I believe the developers have a fix uh, on it. But just be aware you know, pick up these quests, and eventually some of these quests are going to give you silver keys. Now, usually the way that I handle side quests is I just pick them up, and I don't actually go out of my way to complete them. I just progress through the game, and then eventually you will get whatever you need to complete the quest, and it will show up as completed. So if I was to accept the quest, notice that now it shows up with a 
with a checkbox because I already have the materials to complete it. So all I have to do is come talk to the guy and he will complete the quest. Now, I don't actually want to complete this quest, so I'm not going to touch this anymore. But just be aware, these side quests, they're spread out throughout the city. As you can see, there's another one over here. You can see that in the, um, in the compass on the top of the screen. So if you actually go all the way over here, there's another quest over there. You can go and you can pick it up and make sure to complete as many of those as possible. But like I said, do not really go out of your way. Just pick them up as you find them and then keep on doing whatever it is that you're doing, progressing through the main campaign, doing whatever mission you feel like doing, and eventually you will just get the materials to complete the quest without having to worry too much about it. So this is like your very basic information. Like I said, one of the most important things at the beginning of the game is finish the story. Now, I'm not saying you have to rush through the story. Do it at your own pace. But finishing the story unlocks so much more content that I definitely feel like there's not a real reason for you to grind the game, grind the missions, unless you really want to. You can, but you don't have to. That's completely optional. Just finish the story, enjoy the story, and then get into the end game because that's when things get really wild. So now let's talk a little bit more about character progression. We're gonna start things off by talking about masteries. Each character is going to have a mastery tree. The mastery tree is extremely big. There are a ton of nodes to go through. It is going to take you a very long time to complete a character. As a matter of fact, I haven't completed a single one. Now, an important thing about mastery points is they are shared across all of your characters. So you have to keep in mind, if you put all of your points into one character and you happen to be playing solo, all of your other characters are going to be gimped. So you'll want to balance out your party, choose out the party members that you want to have with you, and try to give those a couple of masteries along the way. So in my case, my main character is actually Eugen, and he has his offensive tree completed, and I'm currently working on completing his defensive tree. So these do exactly what the name implies. Offensive tree is all about offensive skills, damage up, so attack up, critical power, all of that stuff. This is the tree where you get all that. Don't stress too much about the choices that you have to make because by the end of the game, you will be able to get everything. The mastery points is some, is a, a resource that never runs out. So you will be able to level up every single character all the way. This is just, you know, how fast you get each character that you're working on. The defensive tree is also extremely important because by the time you get to Maniac difficulty, mobs are going to be one-shotting you if you don't have a bunch of HP and defensive skills and all of that stuff. Lovely. So keep that in mind. And then there's also a collection. This one is tied to your weapons. The more weapons you craft, the, the more uh, nodes unlock here. And you'll have to upgrade the weapons. So, for instance, this is going to become available once I upgrade this weapon to level 50. And it is going to give me 500 hit points. And these are very important because they can be very powerful. So, for instance, the weapon that I have right now, when I get to the final note, it is straight up just giving me 200 attack. Which is quite a bit. To give you an idea, the maximum attack that you can get from the equivalent of, like, attack up 7 in this game is going to give you 2,000 attack. So, that's just, like... 10% of the one of the maximum attack bonuses that you can get. That's pretty important, as you can imagine. And each of them is going to have a lot. Like, look at this. Right now, to give an idea, I have how many hit points? So, in Eugen, I have 26,000 hit points. If I simply upgrade that weapon that I was showing you, I'm going to be able to get 5,000 more hit points on top of that and get that up to 30,000, which is very, very significant. Then you have the Leviathan Muzzle over here, which straight up increases critical hit damage by 30%, critical hit damage by 15. It's insane. It's, it's a ton of bonuses that you most definitely want to get. So you'll want to eventually craft all of the weapons for the characters that you want to main. And once you craft those, you also want to upgrade them all the way. Suffice it to say, there's quite a bit of grind when you reach the end game, and all of this is part of the mastery system. Eventually, when you reach higher levels, you're going to get even another system, which is the overmastery. So this is going to give you four random bonuses that you can re-roll, and these can be quite significant. As you can see right now, my overmastery bonuses are 400 po uh, attack power up, 2% critical rate up, and 800 health up. 
okay? And this goes to three levels. So at level 80, you get your first one. At level, um, at level 90, you get your second one, which is even higher. And then at level 100, you get another one, which is even more. So not only you have your offensive mastery tree, your defensive mastery tree, the collection tree that goes through all of your weapons, you also get overmastery, which has a bit of an RNG element to it. Okay, so keep that in mind. These are all progression systems that you're going to have to engage with at some point if you plan on really min-maxing the crap out of your character. Now, besides this, let's go ahead and talk about weapons. I already showed you that each weapon has mastery points and all of that stuff, but you're going to be required to go into the blacksmith. So let's talk a little bit about how the blacksmith is going to work. You're going to be able to forge new weapons. These unlock as you play through the game. Unfortunately, you only unlock one weapon during the campaign, and then after the campaign, you start unlocking more weapons. But basically, you can see the materials that you need here to craft each of the weapons that I have available to me. And an important thing is that very much like we did with the with the crewmate tickets, we can mark the materials that you need. So for instance, you can see that there's a button on the bottom right hand side there that says details. So you can press that button, in this case it's gonna be square, and we can actually go ahead and add things to our wish list. So let's say for instance, I don't know where to get this heliotrope urn, so I need to figure this out. So you're gonna press triangle to add that to your wish list. Uh, you can also add stuff to the to the wish list based on the number needed. Usually, I just add them flat because that way there's they're just in the wish list until I remove them. So I'm gonna add this heliotrope urn, and this is now on my wish list. Now, if we go again to the um, to the quest counter here, we can very easily go undertake quest, and then if you look bottom right hand side, search by treasure, press square. And we're going to go look for that heliotrope urn, which is this thing. So you press this, and currently I don't have any quests that give it to me. Well, that's really bad. This probably comes from um, this probably comes from Sierra Carte. But let's say you actually got a material that comes from one of these quests, like say this Terra Horn. Press that, boom, there it is. This is the quest that you got to go do in order to get that material. So if a material is not in here in the quest counter, that means that that material you're going to need to trade for it over here. We probably got that material by, you know, uh, completing stuff in the campaign or something like that. But just be aware, you just come over here, as you can see, Dark Orb. I think this is what we were looking for, right? Was it the Dark Orb or did I mark something else? Whatever. It's over here and you're going to need to trade it in for some materials that you've gotten throughout the quest. As you can see, some Rafale coins, Dark Liquid. And then it's like, oh, but I don't know where to get the Dark Liquid very well. Add that to your wish list. And once again... Go to the quest counter and check to see if there's a quest that you can do to get it. A lot of the materials that you can get on quests, you might also be able to get in Sierra Carte. So keep that in mind. Like I said, we added uh, this thing, Dark Liquid, and boom. It tells you right here, you can get this here, here, or here. Just take your pick of whatever quest you want to go and do, and Bob's your uncle. You can get the materials that you need. Usually, whenever you see materials anywhere... You can flag them, add them to your wish list, and then you can sort the quest to see which material you actually need. Now, another important point of upgrading your weapons, as you are going through the campaign, my suggestion would be upgrade whatever weapon you feel like upgrading. It's really not a big deal. But when you finish the campaign, this is where things get very important. So say, for instance, I've been showing you weapons for Rurikon and Oigan, but let's say you're working on Percival, right? You're like, oh man, I want to craft a new weapon for Percival. Which weapon should I really dedicate my time into? And which weapon should I really just pour all of my materials upgrading? Because this is something that I feel like the game doesn't really explain very well. But if you pay attention, look at how this weapon in its name below it, it has a, a like a little subtitle, right? Joyeuse, Stinger, Antwerp, Executioner, Lord of Flames, Ascension Weapon. That's the important one. Ascension weapons are the most important weapons when you first get to endgame because they can be upgraded beyond the blacksmith. And this is something that I feel like the game maybe doesn't do a good job of telling you. At least I don't remember any of this. This was just me talking with my friends and they started talking about ascension weapons. I was like, the hell's an ascension weapon? I have no idea. But these ascension weapons, once you fully upgrade them, they can be uh, upgraded further at Sierra Carte. So to give you guys an idea, luckily, 
and this was completely happenstance, the weapon that I was upgrading was the AK-4A. Now, if we actually go, instead of Forge, we go into Upgrade, go to Oigan, you'll see that my weapon is fully leveled up to the max, and this is my Ascension weapon. And what happens is, once you level up your Ascension weapon all the way up, you're going to be able to go into Sierra Carte, and she is going to have a special menu for you called Weapon Awakening. And then you can go into your character, and there it is. Once I collect the materials that are on the right side there, I will be able to upgrade this weapon even more. I've been told that this goes up like 10 more levels, so that is going to be a significant upgrade for your weapon. Another thing that you can see here is that there is yet another weapon that will be able to be ascended, but I haven't unlocked this yet. I've been told that this is a weapon that you get for defeating the hardest boss in the game, which I'm not there yet because I'm still progressing through the game. But, you know, just be aware that ascension weapons are very important and they have further upgrades beyond the other basic weapons, which probably means that these are the meta weapons, but I'm not 100% sure, which is something that, you know, it's a little bit frustrating, but I just want to put this out there in the guide and then we can talk about how I feel about it in another video or whatever. But yeah, ascension weapons are extremely important. Now, upgrading your weapon is not just about you know, upgrading it and leveling it up and all of that. Um, so, for instance, there's two different things that you can do in a weapon. There is uncapping the max level, which is going to require a certain amount of materials. And th there are several caps as you level these up. But basically, these enable you to upgrade it further. So right now, the sword is 125 out of 125. You can uncap that, and then it goes up to 150. And every time that you uncap a sword, like the sword of Vios that I have here is actually uncapped, it then goes 125 out of 150, and then you are required to level up the weapon using these materials, Fortitude, Shards, Crystals, Crystal M, Crystal L. If you go back to the missions section of this video, I'll explain there where you can go and get these crystals, because it's based on those missions that I was talking about at that section of the video, right? So just be aware, it's fairly easy to farm these, but it is time consuming. It's not hard, but it is time consuming. Now, another thing that you can also do is you can imbue your weapon with something called a right stone. You can only ever imbue a weapon with one right stone, and you can then replace that right stone if you find a better one, but the previous right stone will be destroyed. And basically, as you can see here, these right stones that I've collected, they give additional uh, benefits to the weapon. So in here, we have one that increases your weak point damage and your critical hit rate. Have another one here, weak point damage, skilled assault and attack. Wow, this one's actually really good for Gran. You can basically put this in the weapon and it basically adds all of these stats into the existing stats of the weapon itself. So this is a very cool thing. And then on top of it, as if there aren't enough upgrades to the weapon, there's also Mirage Munitions. So this is something that you can get by doing quests. Uh, you just get these things. Uh, I don't know exactly how to farm these. I haven't really been target farming these yet. But you can level up your weapon all the way up to plus 100, which again increases its stats as you can see right there. You can see it increases your HP, it increases the attack, it increases everything, so keep that in mind. On top of all of the other things we talk about that you can do to upgrade your weapons, you can also do Mirage Munitions. You see, this is where you start to understand that these guys, these, guys, these developers, they actually have a gotcha game. So, progression systems is their thing. There's plenty of progressions in here. However, it's also important to note, there's no free-to-play elements, there's no pay-to-win elements, at least not yet. You know, I'm gonna knock on wood. But, you know, currently there's no pay to win or, you know, any type of free to play mechanics or anything like that. All of this is grindable by just playing the game. And I feel like the rate at which I've been upgrading stuff has not really been super slow. I'm currently about 37 hours into the game. And my main character, which is Oigan, we have a fully maxed out ascension weapon. I haven't really done the mirage munitions, but it is imbued with critical hit rate and critical hit damage. which is pretty good. Uh, and I'm... I could be going out and collecting the materials to upgrade the awakening of it and doing all of that stuff. And I don't feel like I've been, oh my god, I've been grinding this for 10 years. You know, 37 hours, not that long of a time. So, it is what it is. There's going to be a bit of grind, naturally. But, even still, I haven't really gone out of my way to grind that much. I've mostly been progressing the game as needed. 
So, besides that system, which is basically just upgrading your weapon, we also have another system called the Sigil system. Now, sigils in this game work very much like armor in Monster Hunter. This is going to be a system that is going to be very familiar to anybody who played Monster Hunter before. So if you look over here, these are our sigils. We have Lucky Charge, Quick Charge 3, Steady Focus, blah, 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 blah. And you guys are like, what the hell does any of this do? If you look again, bottom right-hand side, you can see that we have Trait Details. Okay, hit that triangle, boom, there you go. Your attack right now is at level 32. That gives you plus 430 attack. This can be stacked up all the way to 50. Now understand something. If you keep stacking attack willy-nilly, you can overcap it, which means you're wasting points. So you want to get exactly 50. You don't want to get 51. I mean, you, you can get 51 if that's like the, the best combination that you can fit. But usually once you go past 50, there's no benefit. Same thing for hit points. We have hit points at level 15. This one goes up to 45, if I'm not mistaken. No, it goes up to 50 as well. So you can get up to 10,000 hit points. You have stun power in here in this character, which I put a little bit, goes all the way up to 45. Guard payback, stun gauge fill, plus attack up 29%. So there's a bunch of skills in here. And once you press that triangle, you can see exactly what each skill does. What are the break... Um, what are the, the breaking points of each of the skills that you are getting here? And these are things that you're going to be getting just for completing quests. There's also a randomness to it, as in, so you have these that are just straight uh, increases. So these are the level fives, which I believe is currently the max level that you can get. But then you have the ones with a plus. These work like the level four decos in Monster Hunter. So they give you two things. So in the case of this enmity uh, four, it gives me enmi enmity and guts. This is random. So you can get different ones. There's also a damage cap in here linked together with low profile, lucky charge with provoke, uh, throw damage with nimble onslaught. So there's a bit of an RNG aspect to some of these sigils. But like I said, they work very much like Monster Hunter skills and you can change them to do your build however you see fit. The, watching the system as it is right now on this one character is probably going to feel a little bit overwhelming, but understand that as you are playing the game, you're going to be getting these over time. Just be sure that you're always equipping something on them as you are progressing through the story, and then once you are done with the story, that's when you really want to look into what each of these does. Now, another important thing is there are also character-specific sigils that have bonuses related specifically to certain characters. Those are available to craft and purchase at the Knickknack Shack. And these are some of the more important things because they can actually unlock different playstyles for certain characters or just give you tremendous benefits for set characters. So the first one of those sigils, you can find it here at the treasure trade. If you cycle once to the right, you can go to treasure. And in here you have this one, which is Stout Heart, which is also very good. This basically gives you, uh, you can't be interrupted by foe attacks. So if you are attacking, you're attacking. Nothing can stop you. It's basically poise. You have infinite or hyper armor. You have infinite hyper armor. You still take damage, but you can't be interrupted. Uh, and it also fills up one of your sigil slots, which is actually fairly important. But the other ones are sigils that are specific to a character. So if you see this one, for instance, Fearless Drive, this is a sigil that is specific to Gran. It even says there, shortens the captain's, because Gran is referred to as the captain, uh, shortens the captain's skill cooldowns whenever reaching a higher arts level. So this one only works for Gran. Then you have another one here, which would be for Catalina. Grants supplementary damage to Catalina and boosts her damage cap while Ares is summoned. Supplementary damage, 10% of damage health. Damage cap plus 15%. We'll talk about damage cap as well. But as you can see, each one of these is dedicated to a specific character. So if you're playing that character, this might be something that you want to consider. Now, the other character-specific sigil is going to be placed in... Uh, where was it again? Knickknack vouchers? Yeah. Trade treasure? No. Trade Dahlia badges. No, this is the one. Dahlia badges. So you go to Dahlia Badges, and then you swap over to Gold Dahlia Badges, which is, again, one to the right side, and then you scroll all the way to the bottom, and you will once again find these ones called Guardian's Honor and Helmsman's Tenacity. 
And again, these are specific to each of the characters. So again, this one shortens Catalina's cooldown whenever he's summoned by 5%. This one increases the attack range and damage cap of um, Rackham. And then you have Mage Savvy. This one's going to be for, I'm assuming, EO? Yeah, this one's EO. Boost Stargate's damage cap. So just be aware, these are very important sigils that you eventually want to work towards getting. And as I say this, one of the things that you're going to notice is that, but Rurikon, these required gold Dahlia badges. How exactly do I get gold Dahlia badges? Yeah, I told you guys this game has a lot of progression systems, didn't I? So, if you go over to the quest counter, there is a specific thing in here called Quick Quest. Now, the way that quick quests work is you go and you undertake a quick quest, and this is going to put you randomly into any of the quests that you've unlocked at this point. If it's a high enough level quest, which is not always going to be the case, you're going to get a gold Dahlia badge. However, my recommendation is do these ones in multiplayer if you are able to. Because once you do these ones in multiplayer, you're going to eventually be able to guarantee that you get a gold Dahlia badge. Whereas if you're doing them in single player, it's a little bit more luck of the draw. So the way that it works is there's these gold tickets that you can see right there, claim gold badge tickets, which is the more of these quick quests you do, the more of these tickets you get. So I can go and I can claim one right now, gold badge ticket. And what happens is if I do one of these quick quests in multiplayer, which is as simple as you go to play online, again, you need to go online. I know this kind of sucks and whatnot because the golden tickets can only be used in multiplayer. So this will speed up your grind significantly if you're trying to get gold Dahlia badges. Now we're currently connecting to an online lobby. It's gonna be a private lobby, it's gonna be just me. And then you can come to the quest counter and you can be like, okay, put me on a quick quest, undertake a quick quest. And then once you get into the quest, when you go to ready up, they're going to give you the option to use the gold badge ticket. Now, the gold badge ticket will ensure that you will get a gold Dahlia badge. The disadvantage is you have to play online, and I know that not everybody wants to do that, but, you know, this is a way to guarantee gold Dahlia badges. I believe you can still farm these in single player, but it is going to be a little bit harder to do because of the randomness of how you do a quick quest. I'm hoping that eventually the team reconsiders the way in which you acquire gold Dahlia badges. And by the way, if anybody knows of a way, a better way to get gold Dahlia badges solo, let me know in the comment section down below so that I can transmit that information. I'm going to make sure to pin that comment or whatever. But currently, I don't know of any way to do that. So, you know, just putting that out there. But yeah, and then once you get those gold Dahlia badges, you're going to need seven of those if you want to get the character-specific sigil that comes from gold Dahlia badges. Every one of those requires seven gold Dahlia badges. I've only gotten two of these so far, one for Eugen and one for Gran, because I've also been playing Gran as like my secondary character. But, you know, these are very important because they give you like some really good buffs. Like, look here, friggin' 50% damage cap. That's insane. And you guys are like, Furcon? What do you mean damage cap? Yes, indeed. It's time to talk about the damage cap. So for that, let me actually swap over to my main character. Let's do it. And I'm going to show you because I actually have a setup in this character that I made specifically for this purpose. So let's go to the Grand Cipher, which is our practice mode. And now, if we look at my character build under gear, you guys can see that in this character we have uh, a bunch of damage stuff. A bunch of damage stuff, right? All of these are basically damage things that add damage to my character. Okay, cool beans. Very well, let's see how much damage you can do, Rurikan. Okay, we're gonna go in here. We're gonna go ahead, trigger the dummy. Are coming our way. And I'm just going to show you guys, one of my most powerful things is going into sniper mode, and then I can just, like, shoot this thing. Bam! That was 38,000 damage plus 7,000 supplemental damage, which is a, a bonus skill that I have. But the point that I want you to see is, like, 38,000 damage, 38,000 damage, 30... And notice that it's 38,000 damage when it crits, and when it doesn't crit. That's the weird part. You're like, wait a minute. What do you mean it's when it crits and when it doesn't crit? When the number is bigger... 
like this, that's a crit. I do a lot of crits, I have a lot of crit rating, but if you ever see the number come up a little bit smaller, which it will from time to time, every now and then the number is smaller, and when the number is smaller it means like that one right there, that one was not a crit, but it's the same damage. What that means is you've hit the damage cap. And this is how you test it. You come over here and you see, oh, are my crits about the same as my regular attacks? Or, you know, if you just see that I keep getting the same damage. And it doesn't matter how many more damage skills I put in here, the damage doesn't increase. So when that happens, you want to go ahead and you want to, let me go into the training menu here. You want to go into your gear and you want to swap out a couple of things. So there's a sigil, which is called damage cap. So right here it says damage cap 5. This is going to increase our damage cap, and currently I don't have one equipped, but I do have a loadout that we can swap into. Uh, not this one. This is my main loadout. And in here, if you notice, we actually have two damage caps instead of the stamina. See, stamina is supposed to increase your damage when your health is full by a significant percentage. So I remove that, and instead I added damage cap. Now, if we look at the trait details, this is increasing my damage cap by 54%. This is both for normal attacks and SBA attacks and skill damage and all of that stuff, right? So, now that I've increased my damage cap, we're going to go ahead and we're going to test out that number again. Now, if you remember, the previous number was like 38,000 something. Now, it's 51,000. Now, I'm still hitting... I'm no longer hitting the damage cap because you can see my regular attacks. I, I might still be hitting the damage cap and critical damage. I haven't fully tested this out. But as you can see, I'm dealing a lot more damage now just by increasing the damage cap. And that is why damage cap is extremely important for you to pay attention to. Because especially as you start getting into the end game, you're going to be going like, dude, my damage is not increasing. What the hell is going on? You've hit the damage cap. Now you have to break the damage cap by getting some skills or some, you know, nodes in your mastery tree or some additional uh, sigils that are going to help you with that. But yeah, that's the, the situation with the damage cap. Finally, we've talked about almost everything that I wanted to talk about. I just need to talk uh, about how you progress your quests. Now, this is a super simple system, so I don't think that anybody's really going to get stuck on it. This works very much like Monster Hunter in that once you finish the campaign, you're going to have key quests. Now, I currently only have one, but usually you will have more than one because I'm still progressing through the game, right? But as you can see right now on the bottom one, there's like a swords crossed symbol, the little orange thing. That means that there is a key quest in this difficulty that I haven't done yet. If we go here, you'll see that it's this one. So that means I have to do this quest and then either we'll unlock more quests in the Maniac difficulty or it will move me towards the next difficulty, which I believe is called Proud. So that is how you progress in the game. Do all of the key quests. You don't have to do all of the quests unless you want to. You just have to do the key quests. And as you complete the key quests, the game is going to continuously advance stuff for you because there's a little bit of additional story even after you finish the main story. There's a couple of more missions that you'll have to do solo. But, um, you know, that's kind of how you progress through the game. I haven't finished the game, but I just wanted to let you know how to do that. Now, finally... There is one more system that we need to look into, which is Curios. So once you unlock the next city, this was already shown in trailers, so I really consider this to be a spoiler, but eventually you get to go to another city called Seed Hollow. Seed Hollow is going to have the same um, the same services that you have in Folke. You can already see them show up on the compass. Blacksmith on the right side, Quest Counter on the left side, Sierra Carte, Knickknack Shop, uh, Dead Ahead. So you can see that already. I even have a quest that I need to turn in around here. But there is a new service that is going to show up eventually at some point in campaign progression. It's not available right at the beginning, but it becomes available reasonably fast. So I'm just walking to the point where you can kind of see it. You can see that magnifying glass there. So that's a thing called the Curio Curio's Shop. Now, since I already finished the game, I can actually just fast travel there. So Zapba's Appraisals. As you complete quests, just for completing quests, you'll unvet eventually unlock curios. Now, I haven't completed uh, too many quests since uh, last night's session because I did a late night session last night with friends. And, you know, I appraised my curios at the end. But as you can see, I still have two of them. You just come over here, he appraises them, and they can be almost anything from 
rare materials to uh, money to sigils. Like here we got uh, an epic sigil, low profile. This is like uh, lower aggro. And then you also get uh, additional, we also got gold. But you can also get monster materials and stuff like that. So usually my suggestion for the curios is, you know, do whatever quests you feel like doing. And when you feel like, oh, I'm, I'm going to wrap up the session now, come over to Seed Hollow, talk to this guy, and appraise your curios because you will get additional things. Or just go there whenever you feel like it. Just be aware that that is a system that exists. It unlocks a little bit later in the campaign. So keep that in mind. But anyways, I feel like that's enough of me yapping. I'm, hopefully this will give you a solid basis as to how you can play the game and all the different systems that you can interact with and all the different progression stuff. If you have additional questions, do leave them in the comment section below. I understand this can be a little bit overwhelming. I'll try to reply to as many as possible. Uh, I guess I should also answer the question because I see a lot of people still asking this. Can I play the campaign in co-op? No, campaign is strictly single player at this point. Okay? Anyway, that's going to be it for now. If this video helped you in any way, like button is super appreciated. If you want more content for Grand Blue or potentially Final Fantasy VII Rebirth that's coming around, and obviously Dragon's Dogma 2, feel free to subscribe, hit the bell notification icon, all of that stuff, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Stay strong, stay safe, peace out.